Welcome to IP Goes Pop, your source for exploring the interface between intellectual property and pop culture. The IP Goes Pop podcast series is created and produced by Volpe Koenig, an intellectual property law firm based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Visit us at vklaw.com. This program should not be considered legal advice. Please consult an attorney for your specific situation. Cheers, listeners, and welcome back to IP Goes Pop, the podcast. This is an exciting episode. This week, IP Goes Pop watches TV, and in particular, that iconic family, The Simpsons, created by Matt Groening. Uh, As some of you may know, the characters of The Simpsons started as interstitial cartoons between the sketches on The Tracy Ullman Show, which began in 1987. They were so popular that they spun off into their own series in 1989, and they've been on TV ever since. Of course, the show touches on many facets of popular culture and is itself really part of the fabric of pop culture as the characters and catchphrases have woven themselves into the fabric of society at all levels. In fact, Homer Simpson's famous do capital D apostrophe O H exclamation point was added to the dictionary. And the definition of that I actually have here is used to express sudden recognitions of a foolish blunder or an ironic turn of events. Certainly something that Homer himself has experienced many times. Now joining me this week is my fellow shareholder with Volpe Koenig, Randy Heiss. Randy practices across all areas of intellectual property, and in particular, heads up the Volpe Koenig Mechanical Patent Group. Uh, Randy, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here with you. Now, to get to the IP part of IP Goes Pop, we're going to look at some of the inventions and creations and the imagination in the universe of Springfield, the town of Springfield where the Simpsons live. And we're going to look at some of the inventions that they actually created. Now, our starting point or our jumping off point for this week's episode uh, is the episode of The Simpsons called Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? This is the 15th episode in The Simpsons' second season. And the setting for this episode is uh, Homer's long-lost older paternal half-brother, and again, nothing's simple on The Simpsons, Herbert Herb Powell, famously voiced by Danny DeVito, shows up in Springfield. It turns out, unlike Homer, he's incredibly successful. Uh, He has his own company, and he has a car company, and he enlists Homer to design a new car, and he gives him complete control. He gives him as much capital as he needs, and he designs a car called the Homer, which is described in the show famously as a monstrosity. Now, the interesting thing is, even though the car that Homer designed is in fact a monstrosity, it has a lot of different features. And the first thing I, I want to talk about, and on our webpage at vklaw.com, we will link to images which show you the Homer, the actual automobile. Randy, the first thing I want to do is talk about protecting the look of it. So the look of the car is almost Batmobile type design. Uh, it has a dome in two parts of it, has a big sweeping back. It's it's a very cumbersome looking thing, but let, let's talk to our listeners about what can you protect as far as the look of even an automobile? Can you really protect what it looks like? Absolutely, Mike. And as you know, design patents are are made specifically to protect the ornamental features of any article of manufacture uh, that can be fixed in a tangible medium. So looking at the Homer, um, taking special note of the uh, bowling trophy hood ornament, there's a lot of features here to like. Now, some might describe it as a monstrosity, but Homer is the everyman. And as the everyman, he put everything in here that he wanted. He had some very innovative features, including the looks and specifically the the separate dome in the back so his kids would be somewhere where he didn't have to hear them. And if, if we look at a number of these features, you could get design patent protection, which protects that ornamental look for the entire vehicle 
for parts of the vehicle, for the inside of the vehicle. Um, there, there's a number of different features here that presumably one would want to protect so that it would keep others from knocking off something as uh, desirable as the Homer is. Now let's talk about the design of it. So would, would Homer have to protect the overall look, so the entire look of the car, or could you actually focus on, for example, you just named a few different interesting features. Do we have to put them all together or can we actually look at them separately? Well, the, the great thing about design patent law is that you can protect the whole or you can protect parts of the whole. And there's a number of different ways of doing this, whether it's filing separate design patent applications for very specific features or filing an overall application that has not only the entire design, but specific features that would then be separately protectable. Now, your reputation is as someone who likes design patents. I don't know if you knew that, but your rep reputation precedes you on the show. What does someone need to do? For example, let's say someone comes up with something that looks really interesting. So the appearance is important, but they are not, let's say they don't see themselves as an inventor. They don't have any kind of technical type of background. Is there something, how, how, what do you, what does that person need, the non-technical person need in order to file for a design patent? What is actually, what goes into the design patent application and is it really that complicated? Actually, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, and I, I shouldn't say that since you've already built up my reputation as being a design patent guru. Um, but all you need literally is pictures of the design. Um, the patent office looks for an enabling disclosure. And all that means is, is you have to have enough pictures so that a person could understand what all the features are that you're trying to protect. And there's multiple ways of protecting those features. And let's take, for example, the Homer. So let's say Herb, who owns Powell Motors, says, we want to protect the Homer. So what Herb would do is come to us and say, here are pictures of this new vehicle. We'd want at least six different views, and those are the six standard views, top, bottom, left, right, front, and back, as well as at least one perspective view, kind of showing how things look overall. And then we could pick not only the overall view, but then pick specific things that might be protectable or desired to be protected in their own right. And they can either be filed separately or even as part of the same application. And that's the beauty of design patents is you can file multiple designs in a single application. Um, and if they are very related, they can all issue in the same design patent. Or if the patent office determines that they are, in fact, separate designs, uh, they might require you to separate them into separate applications, which would then result in separate design patents. So for the Homer, if you're looking at it, you could protect the entire vehicle. You could pr protect just the grill or the front bumpers. Um, there's, there's any number of novel features uh, just looking at it that you would say these features are different. And the only test that the patent office then would want to perform is are these features found in something else, i.e. did you copy something or inadvertently come up with the same design that somebody else had? If so, then it's not protectable. But if not, and in, in most cases when people are coming up with new designs, uh, typically they are protectable. And I'd say that it's a 90 plus percent grant rate by the patent office when you file design patent applications. Now, let me ask you this. So with focusing on design patents, I know you practice in the automotive field. Do you see design patents on different parts of cars and do you see them breaking it down the way you just discussed, for example, maybe the, the fender or the taillights or the headlights? There are very specific examples for that. There has been a, a very recent case, in fact, where Ford was able to preclude aftermarket uh, fender replacements for Ford trucks based on design patents they had specifically for the fender. And the argument by the third-party manufacturer was that it, it is functional to have a fender that fits and, and integrates with the look of the original vehicle. And the court said, 
No, it's still ornamental appearance. This is specifically what design patents are intended to protect. And Ford filed design patents for their multiple components of their trucks, including overall look, fenders, various different features. And each one is then separately protectable, and they can then go and enforce those design patents against third parties who are trying to sell replacement parts. Let's say I'm lucky enough to get a design patent and I get it on one of these interesting features, even though the Homer vehicle was described as a poke in the eye. Let's say that someone does protect some of the interesting appearance features. How long do you get protection for? And does it cost anything to keep that protection going? Those are great questions, Mike. And of course, you probably know, and design patents in the U.S. have a 15-year life and there is no maintenance fee. So once the patent hands you your design patent, you have that right, and that right is enforceable for 15 years from the date that the design patent issues. Now, the rest of the world isn't as kind, and they may charge maintenance fees every five years to renew the design. Um, But in the U.S., you have a, a protectable right that once it's in your hand, there is no further cost to keep it in force other than if you have to go to court and, in fact, enforce it. I think that's a great intro to design patents. I do want to give a little bit of a teaser here that Randy and I will be back on IP Goes Pop, taking a very deep dive into design patents in the world of popular culture um, as it relates to toys and games and cartoons and things like that. But for now, keeping with the Homer for a little bit longer, what about protecting other aspects of it? How could... Uh, her Powell and Powell Motors, if they were not bankrupted by Homer's invention, how could they have protected other aspects of the Homer vehicle? Well, there's also utility patents. Utility patents are something that you can use to protect any functional features, methods of manufacture, compositions of matter, um, bas- basically any structural technological, electronic, computer component in the Homer, you could potentially obtain utility patent protection for, which, again, is, is, is different than the design patent because it doesn't care what the vehicle looks like or what the component looks like. It cares about what elements are used to make that component. So, for example, when they had some very forward-looking innovations in the Homer, And one of them was at least three horn buttons because you can never find one when you're mad. And this is now fairly common on most vehicles to have multiple different places where the horn is active on the steering wheel. So that could have been an innovation at that time had Herb Powell or Homer come in and said, hey, we want to protect something. Um, That was something that was pretty innovative. And, And another thing, it has actually become an interesting feature of the Simpsons that they have this history of predicting things. So even though it's essentially a comedy or family type show, they've actually predicted multiple inventions that have come down uh, years later that end up in the real world. So it's really a a great jumping off point for, for this episode of IP Goes Pop. I want to transition now. So unfortunately, the Homer wasn't very, it, it wasn't very successful. In fact, it bankrupted Powell Motors. Of course, her pal came back strong uh, many years later in another episode where he created an invention that interpreted baby talk, which we might cover on a later follow-up episode of IP Goes Pop. But now I want to talk about um, not only famous inventors that were featured on The Simpsons, but also how older inventions impact later inventions. So to set this up, Let's talk about the Wizard of Evergreen Terrace episode, which is the second episode in the 10th season of The Simpsons. And it's really an entire episode dedicated to Homer getting absolutely obsessed with Thomas Edison. So Thomas Edison, of course, a famous inventor, many everyday inventions that might still be in use to some extent. They've been updated, but they're still part of everyday lives. So Homer goes about deciding that he wants to become an inventor. And if he could ever live up to the legend of Edison. And he invents some questionable things here, including an alarm that beats beeps, an alarm that beeps every three seconds, 
to tell you everything is okay. I don't know if that has a lot of utility. A makeup gun, which shoots an entire face of makeup onto someone's face. And a very difficult and out of control electronic hammer and an untippable chair so you could sit back comfortably tipping your chair and not fall over and embarrass yourself. He particularly gets obsessed with the untippable chair. And I believe it's Homer and Lisa sneak into the Edison Museum and they find that Thomas Edison did, in fact, invent an untippable chair and therefore Homer's invention was not new. Now, just some background in Edison, he filed over 2,000 worldwide patents in his lifetime. He actually had issued over 1,000 patents in the United States in many technology fields. So, Randy, how does it work when someone comes up with something? So Homer comes up with something, then he sneaks into a museum and he finds essentially the same invention. Can he get an invention for that same design? Can he change it? What are your options there? As far as the untippable chair, since that was in the public domain and publicly displayed, it's what we would call prior art, meaning that it was previously known prior to Homer coming up with his version of the untippable chair. So in order to obtain a patent, your invention has to be novel and non-obvious over the prior art. Novel means that it can't be identically shown by either somebody else's patent or something that someone else previously made. And non-obvious means that it's different enough that a person of what they call ordinary skill in the art wouldn't just look at your improvement or your invention and say, oh, that's that's the same as what he did. It's just slightly different. And that difference is, is minimal and not enough that the patent office would grant you further protection. So unfortunately for Homer and his untippable chair, since it was previously known from Edison more than 100 years before Homer invented it and it was publicly available, he would not have been able to obtain a valid patent. And I say a valid patent because unless the patent examiner knows that that prior art is out there, he might not be able to apply it. So let me ask about this. So in the episode, Thomas Edison's heirs, what happens is, Homer goes, sneaks into the Edison Museum. He leaves behind his electronic hammer. Thomas Edison's heirs discover it, and they actually then patent it and exploit that invention, becoming even richer, while, of course, Homer doesn't get anything because of it. Is that something that could happen? So let's say that someone sketches a great idea on a napkin, leaves it on the train. Can someone else pick that up and then say, Eureka, and then control the invention and do anything with it or protect it? Well, being able to do it versus legally being able to do it are two different things. So being able to do it, if nobody discovered that you, in fact, and I'm going to use air quotes, stole the invention or took it from somebody else, if the patent examiner never found out, potentially you could get that patent, even though you weren't the true inventor. Legally, though, in order to get a patent in the U.S., you must identify who the actual inventor was and then show how you, if you're applying for the patent, obtain those rights legally from the inventor. So in the case of Homer Simpson, assuming that Springfield is in the U.S., although we never know what state it is in, Edison's heirs would not have been able to legally get a patent. And if Homer found out, which at the end of the show he does, and only takes solace in the fact that at least Bart thought that the automatic hammer was cool, uh, Homer would be able to come to a patent attorney like you or me and say, hey, they stole my invention. Or even if they just found the invention, they were not the true inventors. And if he could show whatever materials he had and, and the steps he took to come up with it, then he could obtain rights. All right. So if, if Homer had a better attorney than Lionel Hutz, maybe he could have stopped Edison's heirs? He, he likely could have stopped Edison's heirs, depending on what evidence he had to show that he, in fact, came up with it. Now, whether that was an admission that he and Bart broke in to destroy the Edison chair, but then thought better of it. They would certainly have a record of it, you would think, in these days of security cameras everywhere. But it's always, always a matter of evidence. But legally, if everybody followed the rules, Homer would be entitled to get rights back to his automatic hammer. I, I want to talk a little bit about 
Edison's and, and maybe other older inventions. So let's talk about how long patents last. Is there any way that Homer, let's say he found a very old patent on the untippable chair and it was exactly like his invention, but it was back from Edison's time. Would Homer have to worry about violating or infringing that patent? A good question, and the answer is is that patents uh, originally had a 17-year life. That changed with the rules in 1995 when patents were extended to a 20-year life, and that 20 years counts from the day that you file a patent application. Under the old rules, it would counted from the day the patent issued 17 years. So uh, assuming Edison was long gone in 1991 or 92, whenever that episode aired, Homer in real life would have had no worries about infringing any long expired Edison patent had he had such a patent. And what are, just so we complete the thought, what, what are the patent terms now? So if you, if you apply today, what would your term of a United States patent be? So if I applied today, regardless of when the patent issues, the term would, for all practical purposes, be 20 years from today. There are some rules for adding patent term, uh, specifically for drug patents to get through the FDA approval process. And then there's also certain term extensions that are available to all patent applicants, depending on whether or not the patent office itself delays processing your patent application more than certain time limits that they have in place in their internal guidelines. So it is possible that when your patent issues, you have a 20-year term, plus they add an extra 163 days for patent office delays. To wrap up the Wizard of Evergreen Terrace episode, it turns out that uh, while Homer was discouraged because he could never live up to his hero, Thomas Edison, actually Thomas Edison himself, it turns out, was always competing with the great inventors like Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and in fact, one time I was involved in a case that had an expert witness and the expert witness said that there was nothing new since the Egyptians, which got a laugh out of the judge. But in some ways, all the basic principles are out there. And it's really about a new way to rearrange things or to add a certain uh, technological spin to it. And I want to leave the imaginary world of Springfield for a minute, and I want to talk about some real-world legal issues that the Simpsons ran into. This has to do with the Simpsons creator, Matt Groening, going on stage at the 2014 Comic-Con in San Diego. Of course, we now know that Comic-Con started from just a few tables of people selling comic books to kids who were purely comic book fans to a platform for launching the biggest movies and the biggest TV shows and the biggest toys and games in the world. So the Simpsons were there for their 30th anniversary show. And Matt Groening went on stage and actually talked to a projected life-size, and I guess our life, not Simpsons life, life-size Homer Simpson hologram. And it ended up that they were actually sued because of this. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the technology involved and what it meant for the Simpsons to be sued for actually having a hologram. A hologram is, is not even there. It's actually imaginary. So how could someone be sued for talking to a hologram under patent law? Well, you can be sued for a couple of different things regarding holograms. And in this case, the patent owner asserted two different patents against uh, Fox and Matt Groening personally, I believe. And one of them had to do with an, op an apparatus for projecting a hologram, and the other was for a method. So by stepping up on stage and interacting with a hologram, if somebody had in fact patented a method of doing that, and inadvertently or in purpose, we don't know, Matt Groening in his interactions with the hologram of Homer Simpson, in effect carried out the steps that were described and claimed in the patent, then there's the potential for infringement. As far as the device, um, we don't, at least from what I've seen, we don't know what the specific device uh, they used at Comic-Con was, but presumably the patent owner thought it was close enough to his device that he had patented that he filed suit. 
Uh, he should have had a good faith belief before filing suit that, in fact, it was an, an infringement um, based on the press releases that surrounded this and the fact that there was a fairly quick settlement and Fox's denials. I guess we'll never know. The settlement was confidential, so we don't know whether money exchanged hands just to make the suit go away or if it, in fact, was a legitimate case of patent infringement for either or both of the patents that were in question. So this was a case where a real world but non-tangible hologram resulted in a patent lawsuit and in probably some real world payment was likely made uh, to settle the case particularly as quickly as it, as it happened. And I think something in interesting here and something we are going to cover in a later episode of IP Goes Pop will have to do with protection of people's images because if you can create a Homer Simpson hologram, and in fact, the, the same company that owned the patent created a hologram of rapper Tupac Shakur at the 2012 Coachella Festival in California. Uh, soon we might wonder, is this a real person that we're seeing either online or on television or in the movies, or is it some appropriated image? So we'll talk about the right of publicity in a later episode. Uh, it's interesting. Of course, this one even more interesting because it involved the Simpsons. I wanted to talk about another episode here, and this this has to do particularly with the internet and with internet domain names. So in the 15th episode of the ninth season of The Simpsons, we have an episode called Das Bus. And the critical part for us is that Homer became, as he often does, infatuated with something, whether it's outer space, Thomas Edison, eating donuts. Here he was infatuated with the internet and starting an internet company. And as he was thinking of a name, uh, and he had a mental block about coming up with a name, I believe it was Bart who tossed off, well, why don't you just call it something like Compu Global Hyper Mega Net? And of course, that becomes the name of his internet company. Along comes fictitious Bill Gates, the muscle of online, as depicted in this episode. And he wanted the name. Compu Globo Hyper Mega Net, although it is a bit of a mouthful. And uh, they essentially took it from Homer under duress. Now, in the real world, um, could something like that happen? Can you register a domain name? Can someone take it from you? If someone else has a domain name that you want, um, can you take it from them? Randy. Things like that can happen in the real world, maybe not in the same manner, but typically the pressure is applied not with force, but with money. And if you're a cyber squatter, then a, a legitimate owner of a trademark can enforce that trademark right against a cyber squatter. A cyber squatter is somebody who just registers domain names based on famous trademarks and then tries to hold those for ransom to the trademark owner. So while it is unlikely that somebody would have been able to come in and muscle Homer out of his Compu Global Hyper Mega Net internet domain. Certainly they could buy it from him, which he was, you know, counting the money already and telling Marge how wonderful it was going to be, not realizing that all that uh, was going to happen is they were going to come in and destroy his desk and the papers that he had on it, break the pictures on the wall. And, and therefore, in effect, the Simpsons take it by force. And by the way, just a small, a small disclaimer here. Uh, this was not the real Bill Gates. We do not believe that the real Bill Gates would break into Homer's house and destroy his desk. We'll, we'll never know. <laughs> okay. At the end of the day, if you are a legitimate trademark holder, you would have a way to rest away your legitimate trademark used in a domain name by a cyber squatter. However, if somebody did come up with a, a novel name that you wanted and they were legitimately using it, you'd have to try to buy it from them. So the Simpsons... So far, just in this episode, which is why I think we're going to need a second at some point Simpsons episode, has touched on patents, design patents, the Internet, holograms. And finally, to wrap up this episode, our, our last topic has to do with character rights and really the rights in someone's image. So in multiple episodes of The Simpsons, there is a group called the Legitimate Businessman Social Club, which is anything but legitimate. 
And in a lawsuit brought in California, an actor whose name is Frank Severo, I believe that people would know him as the character Frankie Carbone from Goodfellas. It's an incredibly famous role that he played. He also played the young Jenko, uh, G-E-N-C-O, in The Godfather Part Two. So he's a very well-known actor. He fought a lawsuit in California that The Simpsons was essentially stealing his image for one of the characters in the legitimate businessman social club. And in that particular lawsuit, it was it was dismissed under really freedom of speech and fair, fair use uh, type of a defense. But we're going to talk later about rights in your persona, character rights, right of publicity. But for now, I want to thank Randy. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure talking to you about The Simpsons. I'm sure we could talk about many different episodes of The Simpsons, including one of the characters, my favorite character, Judge Snyder, uh, is actually the name of the judge that they always use in The Simpsons. But any last thoughts from you on The Simpsons and intellectual property on The Simpsons? I would just note one famous line that Homer said, and this was in the Bill Gates episode. He said, wow. The internet is on computers. (laughs) And it is. And so are we at IP Goes Pop. So whether you are headed to your, when it's safe, when you are headed to your local Quickie Mart or down to Moe's Tavern, think of us at IP Goes Pop. We will see you on the next episode. The IP Goes Pop podcast series is created and produced by Volpe Koenig an intellectual property law firm based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Visit us at vklaw.com.